Then um, I'd like to um, explain why, I, why I'm speaking first. Uh, Professor Hibai thought my presentation is absolutely indispensable because otherwise he would have a bidding problem with three former deans of the Yucatan Technology <laughs> Panel. So he said, you have to speak so that I don't have to explain to any of the three of them why one of them went ahead first. So uh, <laughs> the only one who's not the dean speaks first. <laughs> And secondly, I guess he also invited me here because I have this distinction in the faculty, I suppose. There's only two of us from the same batch. And we have the distinction of having enrolled in the UP College of Law in 1986, and we're the only batch that did not have constitution. We had a two-page document, a three-page document known as the Freedom Constitution, but we studied constitutional law, including administrative law under the Nagabe without the 1987 Constitution. So I suppose if only because of that symbolic importance that there was indeed a batch in the Yipikari Supro that went through constitutional law without the Constitution, he invited me for that. <laughs> I would like to thank him. And of course, the person who did a very good job of reading our obituaries committed that although I am in a panel of very distinguished specialists, she forgot to mention that my specialty is law as entertainment. <laughs> now, the reality is, when I got the invitation, I thought Professor Kilby was inviting me to attend as part of audience. <laughs> 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 that, he know that he was going to do this, which is just as well. In fact, I just came today from the House of Representatives and I come with good news. The House Committee on Justice, voting 38 to 10, uh, found the existence of probable cause against Justice Mariano de Castillo, Castillo for betrayal of public trust, among others, number one, for plagiarizing at least 31 counts, um, the works of at least foreign authors, in the majority opinion in Binuya, which is the executive secretary, and also for twisting this plagiarized um, portions in support of the opposite conclusions of these foreign authors. Foreign authors, in fact, communicated directly with the Supreme Court uh, to inform them that their works were in support of the conclusion that victims of war crimes should have adequate legal remedy, either before domestic courts or under international law. It was never the intention of the plagiarized authors that their work should be used in support of the decision telling the comfort women, na kawawa naman kayo, because that's exactly what the court said. Kawawa naman kayo because it's one of those rare instances where there is an obvious violation of a legal right, but the rest of a remedy. So why do I start my very short presentation with Vinuya. Well, although we're talking about grave abuse of discretion, number one, the provisions of betrayal of public trust is in fact one of the innovations of the 1987 Constitution. If you compare the provisions of all the constitutions that we had, we did not have betrayal of public trust as an impeachable offense in the previous constitutions. And according to the deliberations of the Constitutional Commission, they intended betrayal of public trust to be a catch-all provision to include acts, even if they are not penal in nature, would nonetheless affect the fitness of an impeachable officer to govern. And that is why, in the deliberations today, much of the debate got centered on whether or not plagiarism was grave enough, number one, to warrant impeachment, and number two, whether or not it is impeachable at all. Fortunately, a an overwhelming number of um, an overwhelming number of members of the Justice Committee, 38, voted that impeachment in fact is an impeachable offense, and that the impeachment in this case, involving no less than 32 counts of um, plagiarism, is grave enough to warrant um, impeachment against sitting justice from the Supreme Court. Now it's also 
don't worry to begin with that case because it is the provisions of the 1987 Constitution on grave abuse of discretion that enabled us in the first place to file that petition for Vinuya. You know, the, the story behind the filing of Vinuya is I got a call from Nelia Sancho. Nelia Sancho is a Marcos Five activist. She said that one of the lolas attended a lecture I delivered for the IHL committee of the PNRC in Thailand, and I ended my lecture there with a statement that certainly we cannot allow violations of uh, legal rights to go without an illegal remedy. So with that in her mind, she looked for Nelia, she brought Nelia to contact me for an appointment to find out if there was any remedy for them at all. Nelia called me, I said, sure. I told her to come at 5 because I had a class until 5, but they came at 3. At that time, I was holding what was then the very first class of international humanitarian law, which we offered as a directive, and this was because we had a program in a project in Gales on the teaching of IHL for law professors in the Philippines, and we thought that we should in fact be the first to teach the subject as an elective. Now, had it not been for the fact that they came looking for a legal remedy in my own class in international humanitarian law, I would have told them, sorry, Bo, but it's been too long. And really, this is one of those instances where we just have to pray for redress in the other life. But I could not say that openly in a class on IHL, where I have emphasized Number one, the non heritable nature of IHL, and number two, the philosophy that no one who commits a great breach of IHL should go unpunished for his acts. Naturally, if only because of, 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 of um, the fact that I was in front of my class, I had to tell the women publicly that certainly there must be new remedies. <laughs> but had they come at some other time, Vinuya would not have been fired. <laughs> Obviously, the first obstacle was, what would be your cause of action? It's been too long. This, coupled with the fact that the Philippine government has been consistent in its refusal to espouse their claims, precisely because of the principle of practice on Zimbabwe. We agreed to be a signatory and a party to the San Francisco Peace Pact, and under this treaty, we agreed to waive any and further claims for reparation. Certainly, these are very good arguments on why no one can compare the Philippine government to espouse the claims. But the rest is history. My point being, it is now the new provisions on the abuse of discretion that gives hope to those who would otherwise have been hopeless for a legal remedy. And I can tell you that these Malaya Lodas certainly are living testaments to this fact. Well, it was also these provisions of great abuse of discretion that has literally enabled activists like me to come to court. Whereas in the past, we would have difficulties in hurting the test of justiciability on the issue of standing. It was in fact in the case of Francisco, which should have been titled Rohe in the first place, had it not been for the fact that Francisco filed his four-page petition four hours ahead of our 80-page petition. <laughs> will have the title of the case. Of course, after that case, they came up with a new rule in the Supreme Court that it is the substantive petition that will contain the title of the case. Unfortunately, that was the case today. And now we have to use the name of Tony Francisco. But it was in that case precisely that we argued that this provision is new, that this provision was intended to put an end to the practice in the past, whereby in Marcos Supreme Court simply deferred the exercise of judicial review on the pretense that it is a political question, best left to a political organ as specified in the Constitution. We said that this was unacceptable precisely because we experience under Marcia law. Nino Yaquino questioned the factual basis for the declaration of habeas corpus. And the justices, many of them, graduates of this institution, simply said, we can't review that. Because that's beyond the ambit of political review. And it was precisely this painful experience in our history that led to a recognition that the courts must exercise this power, not as a matter of discretion, in the same way that it is being exercised in the United States, but as a matter of obligation. And therefore, that particular portion of the ruling in 
broken and let's not call it racist. <laughs> if only because it does not know it is pro anti corona right now. Where Justice um, Carlos Morales actually said that this is when we cut the umbilical ties, as we've argued, uh, between Philippine jurisprudence and American jurisprudence. American jurists have the option whether or not they will exercise restraint. Ours is an obligation to exercise the power of judicial review. I'm not unmindful of the fact that the exercise of greater abuse of discretion oftentimes has been criticized because it leads to judicial supremacy. In my mind, much of it depends really on good faith of the justices. And that good faith is a fact that when they took their oaths as highest magistrates of the land, they would uphold the supremacy of the Constitution and not um, any other interest in the manner by which they decide cases to avoid it. We are human beings. It's an imperfect system. But in my mind, it is certainly an innovation that ordinary citizens like you and I can go to court for the enforcement of public rights. In my mind, that ultimately is the best insurance against these modern regimes. Now, I will not really consume too much of your time because unlike the other speakers, I am not an expert. I am just an activist who benefited from the provisions of the great abuse of discretion. Thank you and thank you.